Welcome to Five Questions with Dr. Ute Kota. Dr. Kota is an RNA biochemist in the Department of Chemistry and Biochemistry here at the University of Lesbridge. She joined the university in 2006 and is one of the founding members of the Alberta RNA Research and Training Institute. She is also the founder of the local chapter of the Let's Talk Science at the University of Lesbridge and which is evidence in a Distinguished Teaching Award in 2015, a passionate teacher. With this, I'm very excited to have the opportunity to have a couple of conversations or a couple of questions with, with Ute here. And I would like to start um, right there where um, your research uh, begins. And maybe you want to talk to us a little bit about um, the areas of RNA research you're involved in and maybe in particular which areas of RNA research you, uh, you think are the super interesting ones. Thank you, Dr. Wieden, for being here with me today and um, talking about what's going on um, in the university, in research, and um, these interesting areas. I've always been fascinated in RNA research. In fact, my very first research internship was in RNA research, and I got hooked. Um, the reason is that RNA is, on the one hand, very simple, just for building blocks. That's almost boring. But as I've seen over the last 20 years, RNA is fascinating because with only four building blocks, it is so important to life and can do so many different functions. And in the beginning of my career, I was very intrigued by all these functions that are being discovered and there have been Nobel awards for all the amazing things RNA can do. But in the last, say, five years, what really intrigues me about RNA research is that we have now reached a stage where it's not only about discovery, what RNA is doing in our bodies, but we can now start to use RNA as a tool in medicine and in bioengineering. And I talked a bit about that in my original public professor series, and I mentioned it in the introduction to this new um, and endeavor, but I, I just thought I'd use this occasion to elaborate a little bit what are the three areas that we can use RNA now for. And so these are really exciting because I think they will have an impact on the entire human mankind for, for its potential. And the first one is something I mentioned in my original public professor talk, and that is the CRISPR system, or it's also known as gene scissors, which has um, had a massive impact in the last 10 years from a basic discovery to a huge patent fight, and now to the first applications. There are applications to potentially cure genetic diseases, there are potential applications in cancer, but also in other areas. And for example, even now in the, in the COVID-19 pandemic, researchers are trying to use this gene scissors as tools to detect and potentially even, even treat the SARS-CoV-2 virus. And so these gene scissors have really been um, amazing in the last years. They're widely known in the public, but there are two other areas emerging that I think have the same potential. And so the, the one I think has um, very tremendous potential is the area of what's called antisense oligonucleotides, or ASOs. And, um, these are drugs made up out, RNA, out of RNA, and the idea is about 20 years old, and for the longest time we didn't know how to get these into our bodies, but that problem has now been solved. And for example, last year when I traveled to Krakow, Poland for the International RNA Society meeting, there was a fascinating discussion at the center stage by the five leading scientists in the world of the potential of these RNA drugs. And I know that some are even developed in Canada, and this is amazing as a potential for more or less every disease that we know of, because you can target every gene in your body that is in some way malfunctioning. And I think that's a huge potential um, for the entire world of medicine. And then now there is the third area, which is brand new. It's an idea that's maybe been only out for a few years and up to the winter, it was more of a dream than reality. And what I'm talking about is mRNA vaccines. Vaccines that are made up of RNA instead of, say, for example, dead viruses or proteins. And this idea has now become super important in the pandemic. And there are several clinical trials going on with these mRNA vaccines, for example, in the US, and they look very, very promising. To the big surprise of some critiques, they seem to work. The people develop antibodies based on the vaccines. They seem to be safe. Now, of course, so far, this has been very small numbers, but the second wave of clinical trials is in the making. And, you know, it might be that RNA 
will potentially be the solution to overcome this pandemic. And there's a lot of potential because again, RNA is only made of four building blocks. So if you use it um, as a tool, you can develop and de um, it very rapidly and adjust it. And I think this is, this is really amazing. And it's for me personally rewarding to see how the RNA field has made tremendous discoveries understanding biology and has now reached a stage where we can really apply this knowledge to change the biomedical system and not just the pandemic but really many 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 diseases thank you very much for for this, this, this exciting and amazing uh, summary of um, uh, emerging research and rna techniques but on that background what kind of um, research questions are you recently studying in your lab and um, maybe you can give us a couple of examples my research is a small puzzle in a big picture. Now that's why I um, have in all my presentations and just in the previous question really focused on what the RNA research field as a whole can do because all of what I've mentioned before has been a combination of research in many different labs. And so this needs to be considered that research is really a teamwork where you need many different people contributing. So where's my contribution? That's your question, right? So specifically in my lab, we study RNA modifications. The chemical change of RNA is such that RNA has more than the four building blocks and up to 100 different building blocks, which makes it more versatile. And there are really two main lines where we, we look at these RNA modifications that occur in our body. And we are at the stage where we first want to understand why they occur in our body and what the functions are. And the first area is the formation of the cell's protein factories or ribosomes because these protein factories consist themselves of RNA. So they use RNA to make proteins and the RNA in these ribosomes or protein factories is heavily modified. But we don't understand when and how it's modified and we don't understand why it's modified. So that's a basic question. But it has far reaching consequences because in every type of cancer, these protein factories are massively upregulated. Every cancer needs to make many proteins. And of course, then every cancer needs many protein factories. And so the idea in the field is that if we better understand how these massive giant protein factories are made, then we can maybe in the future inhibit the formation of these protein factories. For example, with the antisense oligonucleotides I mentioned earlier, and this could potentially be a new strategy to treat cancer. And this is the bigger context of our research. And then we have a second line of research in my lab, and that is really um, more basic and fundamental. And that looks at tRNA modifications. So what are tRNAs? tRNAs are rather small RNAs, and they are important to bring the amino acids, the building blocks of proteins to the protein factories. They also heavily modified, and again, we don't know why. And so here, um, we really try to understand what happens in the bodies. And in the long term, this could have some um, applications in treating genetic diseases where tRNA modifications are misregulated. Um, so really, my research illustrates that you have to start with discovery. You have to understand nature before you can find applications. And we are, we are sitting in that interface of understanding and preparing for future applications. Thank you. That is, that is very interesting. But as you, as you mentioned in the beginning, this is a team effort, right? And team does not end with different labs, but it also happens within your own lab. So I'm, I'm sure you have more than one person working in your lab, right? So you're working with trainees, I, I suppose. So maybe you can tell us a little bit about the trainees that you're working with and what projects there are, at what levels you're working with them. And maybe if you would like to explain how in the, in the current situation with, with being in the pandemic, how that impacts your research and how you, would, how you work around this or with it. Thanks for asking this question, because it's true. Research cannot be done without trainees in the labs that conduct experiments, and it is teamwork. It's truly teamwork. It's a lot of hard work, and I'm really proud of my students. So I, I'd be happy to illustrate who that is and what they are doing. So my team is really a team of um, trainees at different levels, and that's important so that they can learn and help each other. And it starts with one undergrad at the moment, one undergrad student, one technician, five master's thesis students, 
two PhD students and a postdoctoral fellow who has already completed a PhD. So this is kind of a typical team, 10 people, different experience levels, and roughly half of them study the formation of the cell's protein factories and the modification of the RNA in the protein factories, and the other half is working on tRNA modifications, and that illustrates again the teamwork and the, the kind of the puzzle that nature is, where, where you need to put the different pieces together. Well, how's the pandemic going? Um, as you can see from my answers, we are not directly studying the SARS-CoV-2 virus because we are not virologists. We are RNA biochemists. We know what we do well, but we also have to um, recognize where our limits are. So that means we are taking the prudent approach and we are staying at home. So if isolation is the key word in the pandemic and my students and I do the same. We are working from home and that means we are not conducting experiments. This doesn't mean that everything stops. It just means that our work has dramatically shifted. My students spend more time now on educating themselves, reading the literature, taking courses to bring up their skills in the different research techniques. They're also preparing their theses, they're writing research articles, they're writing review articles, summarizing the research that's going on. And that's important background work that needs to be done. And so um, I think we're using the time wisely, but of course we are eager to go back to the lab and conduct experiments, but we also prepare to take a slow and careful approach. Thank you, uh, Dr. Kote. This, is, this, is, um, this has been challenging times for all of us and uh, in particular for the students that I used to, um, to work in the lab. And I noticed that um, one of the um, features that, that we as an institution are very proud of is the research engagement of the students, right? And, you know, having them hands on and these kind of um, uh, unique learning opportunities that we provide them. Could you maybe talk a little bit about the uh, value that you see in education, particularly in these kind of um, situations where, for instance, um, evidence-based decision-making is critical? And what do you think how these, uh, how in, in a current situation you might use different training strategies or teaching strategies for the students? You asked me about the value and importance of education, science and knowledge. And that's a question that's close to my heart. And I think this pandemic really shows that we will not solve this problem, the big crisis the entire world is in without being smart, knowing what we're doing, taking a research approach, really experimenting to find the best and most innovative way to solve a massive problem. And this is true because the problems human mankind is, is facing are ever getting more complex. And we can't solve them with wars or weapons or simple solutions. We really need to take a smart approach. So in this pandemic, for example, to just illustrate it, it's pretty clear that we need science. We need to understand the virus, right? So we need virologists, we need uh, physicians, we need to understand how to treat it, how to develop vaccines. We also need epidemiologists to understand how it's spreading, how self-isolation can help us to limit the spread. But I would say we need more than science. The science is the first line, but we also need, for example, the humanities and social studies. We need to discuss the ethical issues of putting so many restrictions on so many people. We need to understand the psychology. The stress of being in a pandemic is gigantic. Um, we need to understand the disadvantages where certain groups are much faced much more than, than others. So, so I'm thinking here of the black and the indigenous communities. We need to have history to understand how humans adapted, for example, to the Spanish flu and learn from that experience. And we need great teachers and educators who can take care of our children and make sure they get through this, keep learning, keep adjusting. So there's so much that we need, but all of these areas rely on well-trained people who typically have a university education. And so with that, I really want to say that as a society, we need university education, but also from a personal level, this is important because it's great to contribute to addressing the issues human mankind is facing, but also there are more direct benefits. Um, if you go to university, you are, have better chances of not getting unemployed. And that's a huge problem right now, right? We see now the unemployment rate is 
is going up. And so having a university degree protects you to some degree. It increases your salary typically. Um, so it's a long-term payoff, even if you have to first invest tuition. It makes you more healthy. It makes you more educated. And I really think if you can, you should go to university even now. But I understand it's difficult. I understand there are financial issues, there are health issues. And um, that's why it's important that we as a university make it feasible. And that's a challenge, but that's our job. That's what we need to do. So um, the second half of your question I think was about, you know, what we do to prepare. And that's what I have to say, I'm really proud of this university. We stumbled through the spring and we did as well as we could, but I would say that's emergency teaching, right? We had to very quickly shift online. Now we have the summer to prepare for the fall and the university has taken a very strategic approach of deciding now that we will offer high quality online teaching in the fall. And that will be very different from the emergency teaching we did in the spring. And so, for example, we have a teaching center that is developing a lot of support for all our professors and instructors to know how to best engage students. Because when we teach online, it's equally important that we connect and engage our students. That's always been a principle that the University of Lesbridge has held very high and it's also close to my heart. I wanna know and interact with my students. I wanna support them. And I really wanna make sure they have a pleasant experience because if they enjoy learning, they will do better. And so the key there will be to engage. The key will be to be flexible, to use many different types of technologies. Um, right now, I've experimented already with recording video lectures, but that's just step one. We are getting really good in using video conferences to connect live, um, to combine this with reading, with writing, with group work, because even if we are not on campus, we can still do these kind of things. And it's important to make a well-balanced connection of these different elements to offer what I just mentioned, high quality teaching. We also need different forms of assessments. I think we're learning that the old way of just writing down with a pen on paper and answering multiple choice questions is not the way to go. And I think the new assessments we are developing will be better suited for reality. And so our students can be assured that we'll work really hard to make sure they are not just getting a education, but a very good education. And hopefully, eventually, with all these strategies, we can return to campus and for the communities directly. But um, as a first step, it's important to understand that even virtually engagement and high quality teaching is possible and we are working hard on preparing for it. I could not agree more. And I noticed the passion that you are putting forward and actually getting this off the ground on, uh, although the circumstances are a little bit challenging for us. And on that background, it's pretty interesting that you are the incoming um, University of Lethbridge Board of Governor Teaching Chair. And could you quickly outline for us what this position is about and what excites you about this new upcoming role? I'm very honored and grateful and happy to be the incoming teaching chair at the University of Lethbridge because indeed this is close to my heart and has always been over the last 10 years. I've worked so closely with the teaching center I've made many friends and met great colleagues across all disciplines on campus who all care about high quality teaching. And that's what makes me so confident that we can do this. We can adjust and find a new way to really engage with our students in the fall. So to first answer your question, the Board of Government Teaching Share is both a recognition and a task. It recognizes obviously highly excellent faculty members and I feel very honored to be among those but it also has the task to enhance the teaching excellence at the University of Lesbridge. So it's a two year term with the task to be really a leader in teaching excellence development and to have an impact on the entire teaching community at the university. That's a big task, but especially at these times, I think there's nothing more important. And I'm, I'm humbled to be tasked to do this, especially now. Um, and I think there are two main areas where I really hope I can make a difference and I'll, I'll do my best towards it. So originally I proposed to focus in my two year terms on graduate education because the University of Lesbridge is a, in a unique position as a comprehensive university with a strong and long tradition of undergraduate education 
but also an ever-growing strength in educating masters and PhD students. And I really feel that we can build upon that and um, really connect undergraduate and graduate research and traditional teaching at the university even more than we have done before. That's a long-term, very important project. Now, at the moment, as I just mentioned before, many graduate students are sitting at home in self-isolation, and that limits their ability to pursue their degrees. It limits their ability to conduct experiments or to visit the library or to do all the different things they, they want to do. So, therefore, I, I feel grateful that I got permission to actually start my project early. And we just collected a lot of data from the grad students through a survey to see how they are doing. And the data have not been analyzed, it's too early, but they look very different and interesting to what we have, for example, from typical surveys conducted last year. And I think it's important to recognize that this is a vulnerable population and we need to understand how to help them right now. And um, I, I hope that by forming the right collaborations between the teaching center, the School of Graduate Studies and other units on campus, we can make a difference there. So really this project had a long-term vision and all of a sudden it has a short-term emergency. But secondly, of course, as I mentioned before, the big challenge at the university is to move to online teaching. And luckily the teaching center had pursued this area already in the past, but it was sort of a niche and only a few colleagues picked it up. And now everybody has to do it. So they are doing great, and I am I'm grateful for the leadership the Teaching Center provides. As I said, they are offering courses, and I participated already. And I think I do that because my role at the moment is to be a role model, and then to inspire others to really take this challenge seriously, and to also see that collectively we can do it. Um, so I have to learn myself. I, I'm not better than anyone else. I haven't done this before, but. Um, so taking the courses is the first step, inspiring colleagues to take these courses is another important role. And right now we are forming communities of practice where I'll be a facilitator to really help engage the entire campus community in this task to develop high quality teaching, to discuss the different strategies, to be as adaptive and flexible as possible, to accommodate our student needs while maintaining high quality. And I think that's really important that we see that we will use different formats and different approaches, but the goal has not changed. The goal is always to provide high quality education to all our students so that they get set up on a good path for their lives to make a difference. Thank you, Dr. Kuta. And um, I wish you all the best in getting this off the ground and all of us to be able to implement this. Thank you for turning in uh, for today's five questions with Dr. Kuta. And, um, Stay healthy.